Professor Sokol. Hi. Um, well, I'm going to take a little bit further from Europe, and we're going to go to Latin America, and specifically to Colombia, to a project I've been involved for the last two years. Um, it's an academic project, but has quite a lot of components that is non-academic. So my work is, um, in the last seven years, I've been involved in uh, um, concepts of creativity in collaborative practices. And this involves myself as an ethnographer. I'm using different models of uh, ethnographic research to try to understand the concept of creativity when it comes in processes of collaboration. One of the things that I've been looking quite, um, I will say, passionately um, beyond academia, and this is my own, let's say, activist work, is basically resistance uh, in urban contexts, but as well in uh, relation to commons, what is actually commoning in uh, uh, moments of crisis. So basically, uh, when I was asked two years ago to be involved in this project, I was very much intrigued because it kind of map around uh, issues that came uh, within and beyond my academic, um, let's say, position. And this has to do specifically with Colombia because at the moment it's in a phase, in a stage of post-conflict. Um, there are issues of, as you know, in the last couple of months with the peace. And specifically in the case of that city, Medellin, that most of you may know it as a center of uh, the drug trafficking during the years of Escobar. Um, at the moment, what it is known about Medellin is that it is considered as a model of urban innovation in Latin America, not only. That's how it has been branded. So this particular work that I'll show you is with regards to specifically the moment that it is now in Medellin and in uh, transition uh, in various um, ways, but as well as a way to start um, kind of, um, how to say, to think and reflect in reference to quite a few things that we probably discussed today um, with regards to the commons, I mean, with regards to collaboration, participatory budgeting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing which is interesting when we talk about Latin America is that quite a lot of things that we think that are, are fresh and new uh, here in Europe or in uh, the Western context is no new for them. I mean, concept of commons and commoning is something that has to do with the indigenous cultures. It has been for years and years, not if we say centuries is imprinted in the way they live in, and um, participatory budgeting has been really applied even in the case of Colombia. Medellin has a fantastic example as in the municipality of using participatory budgeting, and as well something else which is called social urbanism. Um, in reference. So I will take you through a little bit of that, but as well um, how I'm creating the methodology together with the groups that I'll discuss specifically. As you see here, I'm using quite a few of keywords that make sense or nonsense. It's a way actually to put everything in one line and to trying to get through what I'm trying to explore. Uh, one of the things that I've been uh, interested in is not communities, but networks. Um, myself, my work is a rhizomic, um, uh, quite nomadic in the way I do the research, but as well, the, um, the research actually itself is very nomadic, it's very infused uh, within and around networks. So quite a few, like uh, Bram knows me from work I've been doing in Greece, which is, take me there, my idea. It's, um, so basically, um, just a kind of few slides to just give you kind of a context where I am. Uh, what I've been looking is um, um, commu I mean, network communities, concepts of authority, authorship, and voice, who is voice within the network, how that is uh, happening, um, and uh, diffusion and, um, in, um, of uh, power structures as well. And in uh, 2015, um, in uh, a festival of digital technology and cultures in uh, Berlin, Transmediale, for those of you who may know, I ran a workshop which was uh, having the initial CNFM, which meant commoning the networks, feminist methodologies. 
Um, quite a lot of my work is based on feminist and queer methods, and I'll explain you why. I may sound a little bit over the top, but quite a lot of this work is based on concepts of solidarity, politics of care, and uh, most and more importantly, conflict and failure. So I'm start with the approach of failing. What happens when you're failing? So when I'm looking on concepts like Colombia, I'm looking not so much on the issue of peace, but about the conflict and um, silences and uh, issues with regards to failure. And quite a lot of the um, work uh, with the um, groups I'll show you in a couple of slides um, uh, is about uh, failing. So from that particular workshop, which was my initial kind of idea of how I'm gonna start working on methodologies, quite a lot of these words came up. I mean, which is collaboration, I mean trust, um, particularly, for example, continuous protests that you cannot con uh, stop actually being in a resistance and in struggles. I mean, when we're talking about the commons, the commons cannot be something static, it's changing, and it's through actually resistance of various forms. Um, it is open. It's inclusive, of course, and it's about space. You cannot, again, talk about the commons without having spaces to, uh, um, based upon your work. And of course, this came with and trying to actually, okay, I'm looking specifically not in commons in a generic manner, but when we have, we're talking about creativity, we're talking about cultural values as well. And this is particularly what uh, I think is of interest to look what and how we can actually define cultural commons. So I could say as well, and I can add to this slide, that through complex terms as creativity and culture, we can understand the commons as value system, a governing principle and ethics, and a way toward counter hegemonic relations. So it's under this approach, commons are seen through the logic of arts production, within capitalism and propose feminist values in particular of reproduction, care and sustainability, a basis for cultural commons. So it's about reproduction we're looking at when we specifically talk about um, arts production and obviously the making of um, the practices of commoning. Oops, this is not how it was this. It was a triangle, we were probably at Eve's. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> it transferred to this. Anyway, imagine us <laughs> a very symmetric triangle. So, um, yes, it's hacking the <laughs> my presentation. Anyway, so basically, um, trying to understand my work, I work through probably geometric figures. Maybe my geography background is here. So, um, how could we think of creating cultural commons? I mean, you need three parameters. I mean, you need, as I said, spaces, you need the practices, practices in this case of commoning, and you need, of course, the actors in that. And how, and this is basically the axis, let's say, or the um, foundation of my work. I work with this particular graph and convert it and adapt it according to the, to the specific, let's say, case studies I'm looking in particular. This is where I am here now. This is where I was asked two years ago to be involved in this grant that was funded by the British Council, and here the first problem starts. I mean, for those of you who know, don't know, British Council is one of, uh, let's say, the biggest funders in UK. It has, however, quite of an issue of power and hegemony, and uh, I can say as well that it's quite colonial in the way it approaches the funding. Uh, to give you an example, in the case of our funded project, it gave us money only for the UK um, academics and practitioners to uh, visit Colombia, not the other way around. So this starts as the basis and the beginning of a very kind of uh, known, um, I say, a uh, hierarchical kind of relationship between us and the Colombian uh, partners. But anyway, 
When I was asked to be involved, they asked me to look specifically on cultural values and heritage, having a mindset of what we think as heritage in the moment of uh, monuments, of uh, museums, of what is actually the grand narrative of the history of Colombia, who is in this making, or basically to remake it. At the moment, Colombia is trying basically to reshape its history with quite a lot of silent moments in its history, which is quite problematic as well. So my approach in research is that I have the ability to have some little money, so let's hack the money, let's hack the institution, and let's use this money for another purpose, actually to facilitate and give voice to those who don't have access to this funding. So what I actually did in that moment, I asked my own networks, um, for example, Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, one of them, to give me some advice on whom to actually to uh, contact in Medellin beyond the museums, etc. that they told me from British Council to do so. So the, here where I am, where I realize that at moments of this grand narrative, of uh, peace and the post-conflict in Colombia. They're in the verts, in, the, in between, let's say, um, some cracks. I mean, I'll use here John Holloway, I think, the crack capitalism. Anyway, so basically they are small initiatives uh, working with the communities uh, as art practitioners who are not so visible, but at the, at the same time, they're doing very important work in documenting and voicing those who are not being heard in the history of Medellin or in the history of Colombia. And these are the communities, or la com the comunas, as they call them in, uh, the, in, uh, I mean the locals. So here we are. This is a nice map of Medellin. Um, it's not very visible, but it's uh, where the five groups that I'll show you are based. Um, it's, uh, I'm not gonna say much about the map of Medellin because it's very complex, but what you see um, in the very, very center, this is the very center of Medellin, and the rest of the city are um, the communists or they're not favelas in the Brazilian context, but they, let's say they are less, they're disadvantaged, let's say, in neighborhoods. Here it is actually specifically the network, and I'm calling it just simple the network. There are five different groups of uh, art practitioners and cultural producers, and I keep this uh, kind of uh, terms. First uh, is uh, Plato Edro. Uh, or otherwise in a very kind of a simple um, translation means, um, in a sense, Plato's cave. It doesn't have much to say, but what is important here uh, is that their focus is on methodologies. They use these fine two keywords, buen vivir and buen conocer, which is good living and good knowledge, and it can be um, freely translated. Here, actually, Michelle can... Uh, correct me, something like, I mean, goods. In a sense, it's a very simple way to uh, describe what it is within the commons, that you need knowledge, dispersed knowledge, and you need as well good living. Particularly the good living as a concept is, uh, comes quite back from indigenous uh, population uh, in Colombia and Ecuador, and it actually includes as well the non-human elements, which brings us back to the very basic understanding of the commons, of natural resources. Um, and uh, Plato Edro is a community, most of all, it has a location, this house here. Uh, it's a new media uh, center using audiovisual, basically, work. Um, they, their methodology, apart from using the Buen Vivir and the whole concept of the commons, they use peer-to-peer -peer learning processes and what they call trans-feminist approaches to uh, technology. Um, they work um, directly with disadvantaged youth, particularly for communities which are known for drug trafficking and from uh, war-related crimes. And uh, this is one of the many projects they've done last year, which is called Manga Libre, or otherwise Making Common Space, is a free um, kind of space in front of, the, of their, um, how say, 
of their location, working with the youth, of making something out of this space. I'm going to go very, very fast because I can see um, <laughs> Bram telling me the time. So this is the RECO system. They have residences. They have uh, a school. They have what they call a um, coding school with, with uh, young people from the communities. And um, they work, uh, as I said, with various groups. Uh, these are the two different eco ecosystems. The one is actually how they finance themselves. I can give you more information later if you want to. Second group is uh, Proyecto NN, and this is an architects-based group. One thing I have to say, that all these groups, they have something very important in relevance to Colombia, to modern Colombia, that they are all young people under 30. They come from a very international, let's say, background, an international meaning from uh, Colombians who lived and were exiled in uh, the um, in United States and coming back as second generation American Colombians. They are uh, people, uh, they are hackers from uh, Europe, and they are, of course, locals um, as well. Uh, this is uh, some photos from NN work. Cartografia Sonoras, which is actually it's, uh, run by uh, one of the guys uh, who belongs to one of the communities, uh, and he's from an indigenous descent, meaning from outside Medellin, and he works with actually documenting with children the sounds of the neighborhoods and basically creating active citizenship with a young, um, I mean, stu um, high school children. Here you can see what they do and Casa Tres Patios, which is more like a, co um, a kind of an art collective gallery that their main focus is actually autonomous education practices and pedagogies, um, hierarchical concepts of uh, knowledge making as well. And the last one, it's a more kind of uh, what you expect is Unlocke, which is a hacker space at the moment is changing and converted to a biohacking uh, kind of school of uh, um, experimenting with uh, uh, DNA and other sorts of uh, concepts there. And what is then the network? Is what they call it the collaboratorio. I mean, what I can learn from there, or I have learned, is actually the processes of collaboration within the network. Uh, and uh, how they will try it through their practices as well to hack the institutions, basically. How they can possibly, with what they do, they find possibilities to get funding from, um, uh, how say, from institutions, art institutions in Medellin and in Colombia. This is the cultural value of the network. And, okay, so far everything as I kind of present is fine and fantastic and we can learn a lot. But together with what we can learn as best practice, at the same time there is this list. I don't expect you to get through this list, but this is where the issue is coming. The lack of trust, which is a main issue, and of course when you look at it and reflect, particularly as I do as an ethnographer, it comes way back with the tradition of the history, of the current history in Colombia, that the problem is about trust. Because of how the whole situation was involved in the country, you don't trust not only the institutions, but within your groups as well. So that's one issue, main, and of course, how do they communicate this fantastic work they've been doing? This is where I was asked, to actually help them and facilitate, to create the possibilities through a certain kind of methodology to articulate what they've been doing and to start kind of working against this lack of all those things that you can see here as a list. This is what they are right now. I'm not gonna go very much through because I can see that Bram wants me to finish very soon. Um, but I will get very, very quickly to what probably uh, I was asked to be talked about today, but I wanted first to get you through of what is uh, the, the project and to come to the methodology. Since 2010 that I've been involved in this ethnography of collaborative practices, I've myself looking on the ethnography I've been doing as a, not a method, as a practice of learning, 
And uh, through that, I'm trying to understand what is the ethnographic model. I think as well ethnography as an open book, as an open source that you can actually share, change, and adapt according to situations. These two quotes are taken by two people I've worked quite closely. They are based in uh, Italy, art is open source. For those of you from Italy, you may know them. Um, Salvatore Iaconesi and Oriano Persico. And it's the other ones that they actually start looking on the concept of peer-to-peer -peer ethnography with reference to obviously digital networks. In my case, I take it back to the physical location as well. And I've been looking how I can adapt that with the groups I'm working. So basically the groups are the ones that they're running and work the, um, the ethnography. Here you can see how it works. Where am I with reference to the rest of the people or the groups within the network? And when things change, positions change and relations within the network, then the peer-to-peer -peer ethnography changes, I mean the narrative. So it's about relations and positionality in the model. And this is where basically and what we're building with this network in Medellin, these five uh, bullet points. The polyphonic, which again comes from Italy, from uh, uh, Massimo Canevazzi, the, uh, the anthropologist, where he worked in Amazon. In Amazon. See, see? Okay. The polyphony that you need multi voices within the network. There is no one single voice or position. It's micro history, no, not grand narratives. The third info space, I'm not going to take you too much into this. You can see from this. And the recipes. You need to think of recipes and assemblages. The assemblages is not just the human element, but as well the non-human. And how, of course, all this knowledge we are building comes back to the original kind of uh, question, which was the cultural commons. How do you feed back and inform in reference to what was our key, um, how to say, question, basically. What kind of cultural commons can we see being made in medicine in particular. So to my view, it's a kind of a way to start approaching and reflecting and of course evaluating to what we've done so far. And it's adaptable as a, as a methodology, of course, of course, in all the contexts as well. So I'll leave it here. So there's lots probably that may, you may want to ask because I went quite fast in, at the very end. Um, but that's, that's where I am. I'm going back to Medellin in February, where we are developing specifically the methodology with the five groups involved in the network. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, okay, I'll take it very simple. Do you, I mean, do you love cooking in a set? Yes, and you use recipe books. So you need two things. You need, of course, the ingredients. You need, for example, all these keywords that are used in the beginning in one of the slides, but then it's actually how you assemble them together to make the narrative, to make the recipe happen. So basically, you need these two things. Yeah, that's how we use the concept of the recipes. Yeah, to work through the um, concepts and the tools, let's say the tools that you, they use, for example, in their collaborative practice, and how they communicate through putting them together to make the recipe successful, let's say. Successful in the sense of communicate the recipe. Yeah. Okay, Pani, thank, thank you very much. Thank you.